Hi, I'm Lucy, and I'm totally not a robot. In a couple previous videos, I've started building this breadboard computer based on the Intel 8086 microprocessor, and got it into a state where I can monitor all the outputs, single-step the clock, and kind of understand how the bus cycle works. The execution starts at address FFFF0, and from there, the 8086 starts reading instructions from memory, but the problem is, that I don't have any memory yet, so it just keeps reading garbage, and eventually even starts executing it. Which leads to things like this, where it tries to write data to address 07FFE, and if you remember, in the last video, it was 0FFFE, so it's clearly non-deterministic. And I would really like to do something about this, so the plan is to add something that will respond to address FFFF0, and return the same data every time. So here I have this AT28C256 ROM chip, which should do the trick. As the name suggests, it is 256 kilobits, so 32 kilobytes, and that's more than enough space for my experiments. But if I look at the datasheet, there are a few things that I need to figure out. So firstly, the chip has 15 address pins, which are in a somewhat random order, so the wiring won't be nice, but I think I can figure something out. At the same time, there are 8 data pins, or I guess they are labeled I.O. here. The chip works as one long array of 8-bit values, so when you set the array index on the address pins, the respective value appears on the data pins, and you can read it from there. But that's a problem, because on my current computer, the address and data bus is shared, so when the microprocessor sets the address, it doesn't read the data, and when it reads the data, the address is no longer available. And I've looked at that in the last video, when the 8086 sets an address, it assumes it is valid until a new address is set, so it looks like I need to find a way to somehow remember, or if you want latch, the address. Luckily, I have this 74HCT573 chip here, which is an 8-bit latch. And of course 8 bits is not enough, because the address is 20 bits, so I need 3 of these, but guess what, here they are. And I think it's worth to pause here for a bit, and say a few words about the 74 series chips. This is the first one that I'm using, but we're going to meet much more of them as the computer gets bigger. The 74 series is a family of chips that implements basic operations, such as logic gates, SR latches, flip-flops, counters, and more. Wikipedia has a list if you are interested. And if you're going to attempt to replicate what I'm doing, it's important to get chips that can handle the 5 volts that the computer is running at. There is the 74HC series, which operates at 3.3 volts, and that's not compatible. But then there is the 74LS series, which runs at 5 volts, and what I have here, the 74HCT series, which can do both 3.3 and 5 volts, and either of these is a good choice to pair with the 8086. And now back to my computer. I want to insert the latches between the microprocessor and the bus LEDs, so I'll start by disconnecting the 20 bus wires, as well as power, and add an extra breadboard between them. Now of course I have to connect the new power rail, and add the 100 nanofarad capacitor. And now that I've got enough space, let's have a closer look at how the 74HCT573 should be wired. So besides the power pins, it has 8 inputs, and 8 outputs, which is quite straightforward for an 8-bit latch. Then there's the OE pin, or output enable, which, as you would expect, enables or disables the 8 output pins. And finally the LE pin, or latch enable. While this is high, the values from the 8 input pins are copied to the 8 output pins. And when it goes low, the output pins remember the last value. So let's see how this works in practice. Obviously, things won't align as nicely, because there will be extra pins on the side of each chip, so let me start by only connecting the 8 white wires back, and align them with the first latch.
So there it is, and technically, the chip is upside down, because I need the inputs on the top, and the outputs on the bottom, but that shouldn't be a big deal. Now let's add the two remaining chips, one on the left, one on the right. It did take a little bit of effort to get them in, but there they are. Now let's connect the remaining purple wires. Okay, not too bad, I'll continue by connecting 5 volts and ground to each of the chips. Oh, and I've noticed that I've been too hard on one of the capacitors, so I'll replace that as well, just to be safe. Beautiful, so now with power flowing to all three chips, I want to take care of these four unused inputs. I don't want to let them float, so I'll just tie them low. But you know what, I'll actually only tie the first three low, and I'll use the last one. I've noticed in the datasheet for the 8086, that the BHE signal is only valid during T1, and otherwise serves as S7, or status 7. It does say later, that S7 is an unused status bit, but it doesn't change the fact that the BHE signal should be latched as well, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. And that sorts out all the inputs, let's move on to the output enable pins. But these are simple, I want the output to always be enabled, because the latches should be the only thing ever driving the address bus, so I'll tie all three output enable pins low. And it's getting a little bit crowded on the power rail, hopefully I'll be able to jam everything in. Yeah, that works, now I can move to the latch enable pins. First, I want all three chips to behave as one, so I'll connect all three latch enable pins together. And with that done, I'll need the actual trigger. And what a coincidence, I'm looking for a latch enable signal for the address bus, and the 8086 has a signal called address latch enable, which does exactly what I need, so lucky me I guess, I'll just need to root it down. There it goes, that should work, so all that remains is to connect the 20 address bits back to the LED bars. And that's it, that should work. Now the moment of truth, let's connect power and see what happens. Immediately you can see, that all the outputs are high by default, but I don't care about that, everything is in an undefined state anyway. But at least I know that all the LEDs are still working. Let's go through the reset sequence and see what happens. And look at that, there's the FFFF0. But now as I pulse the clock through T2, T3, and T4, the address is still there and only changes on the next T1. So that's wonderful, that's exactly what I was looking for. But I'm not done yet, because though I now have the address bus connected to the LED bars, I've lost the insight to the data bus, which I mean, less than optimal. Ideally, I'd like to have both the address and the data visible at the same time, so let's disconnect the power, and expand the computer a little bit. So far, I've only been adding breadboards vertically, and the computer is getting quite high, so I think it's about time to start expanding to the sides as well. Of course, new breadboards means new power rails, so let me connect them, not forgetting the 100 nanofarad capacitors for decoupling. There it goes, and next I'll rip off the LED bars, because I want to move them elsewhere.
and of course the resistors too, they're of no use without the LEDs. So with that out of the way, I'll add a couple more breadboards that I've prepared off camera, one with 20 resistors already fit in, and the other one with 16. And I think you might be starting to understand where this is going, but let me keep building for a bit, and I'll explain the plan as I go. I'll fit the two LED bars that I've just ripped off, to the upper left corner, so that they align with the 20 resistors. And here I have two more, to fit on the other side. Of course, only the first 16 will actually be wired, but that's exactly what I need. More breadboards of course means more power rails, let's connect them. Here in the upper right corner, I have to move the resistor out of the way, which if you look carefully, I've messed up, but my past me will only realize that later. Now the 100 nanofarad capacitors. It's quite crowded towards the center, so I'll actually move them out of the way, hopefully in a way that they stay visible on camera. With that done, I'll proceed by removing the 20 wires that now just hang off the latch's outputs and move them to the left to align with the 20 LEDs. And I'll do a similar thing on the other side as well. So by now, I think the plan is pretty clear. Here on the right, I'll have the 16-bit data bus, and here on the left, the 20-bit address bus. And I want them to go all the way down, which means I have much more wiring to do. So here I am supposedly halfway through, I still need to connect the two sides of each breadboard together. And of course I don't have purple and white wires of the correct length, but for better orientation, I'll still try to do each bite with a different color. Oof, that took one whole eternity, but it's done. And I suggest you remember this picture, because it is supposedly the last time, that the computer looks nice, orderly, and relatively simple. Let's start turning it into a spaghetti of wires. Now I need to connect the 20 address lines, from the outputs of the latches, to the newly built address bus on the left. And of course the bottom 16 bits of the latches inputs form the data bus, and that needs to go to the right. The problem is, that the trick with nicely aligned wires that I did vertically, doesn't really work horizontally, there are just not enough holes to fit 16 or 20 wires, so I'll have to cheat a little bit, and go up. Let's start with the data bus. Okay, that's actually not too bad, let's see if I can do the same for the address bus. Not as nice, but I guess it is four more wires, and it's not a complete disaster, so I'd say good enough. So to recap, what I have here is 20 bits, going from the 8086, through the address latches, to the address bus on the left. Similarly, I have 16 bits, going directly from the 8086, to the data bus on the right. Oh, I've noticed a missing capacitor on the upper left rail, Let's quickly add it. And so assuming I didn't mess up anything else, I should be able to power the computer on and see the address and the data independently, so let's try that. Well, it looks like I've messed up, the clock signal is always high. If you remember, I've had to move the resistor to make space for connecting the new power rails, and while putting it back, I've connected it low, when it should have been high. But that's an easy fix. Here goes nothing.
And look at that, there's the FFFF0, that's a good sign. Of course the data bus says just FFF0, because it's 4 bits shorter, and because we're at T1, the bottom 16 bits are shared. But let's step one clock pulse forward, to T2, and see what happens. And look at that, the address is still there, but the data has changed, supposedly to all zeros. Let's keep going forward, T3, T4, and the next T1. The address has progressed, but it looks like one of the data LEDs is not working, let me check the wiring. And it looks like a loose resistor, let's just mash it in place. There it goes, good enough. So let's move forward a bit faster. Clearly the read LED is not working, it's always low, but I'll fix that later. And here we've arrived at the point where everything goes wrong. In this case the address is 07FFE again, and it doesn't look like a loose resistor this time, because the first LED is also off on the data bus. Let's pulse the clock one more time. Okay, so it looks like the 8086 is trying to perform a write, to address 07FFE, and the data has changed to something completely random, if I read it correctly, it is, A2F4, and really, no idea where that came from. But now, if I pulse the clock a few more times, it looks like it's getting back on track, with address FFFF8. But that's all alchemy, the microprocessor is still reading completely arbitrary values, and it can do whatever it wants. And I think that's where I'll leave it for this video. I didn't manage to connect the ROM chip as I originally intended, in fact I do expect a few more problems with that, but I've certainly prepared a better ground, so I'll see if I can manage it in the next video. So, stay tuned I guess.